Hello, and welcome to Storytelling Live. Tonight, we read uh, The Leak or the Silver Box by Jacques Futrell, and that is uh, one of the uh, many serial stories of the great thinking machine, who is not a machine, but he is a human. So last week we talked about madness, this week it's clarity, it's lucidity. So I'm going to read this intro, this little bit from Goodreads. Jacques Heath Futrell, 1875 to 1912, was an American journalist and mystery writer. He is best known for writing short detective stories featuring the thinking machine, Professor Augustus SFX Van Dusen. Futrell worked for the Atlanta Journal, where he began their sports section, the New York Herald, the Boston Post, and the Boston American. In 1905, his thinking machine character first appeared in a serialized version of The Problem of Cell 13. Cell 13. In 1895, he married fellow writer Lily Mae Peel, with whom he had two children. While returning from Europe aboard the RMS Titanic, yes, the Titanic, Futrell, a first-class cabin pass passenger, refused to board a lifeboat, insisting that his wife board instead. He perished in the Atlantic. His works include The Chase of the Golden Plate, The Simple Case of Susan, The Thinking Machine on the Case, The Diamond Master, Elusive Isabel, The High Hand, My Lady's Garter, uh, and Blind Man's Bluff. So the other side of the human mind is lucidity. There's a new crime fighting and information gathering technology on the forefront of this new world of uh, post uh, uh, 1890s, uh, beginning of the 20th century. It's the telephone. The name, the name thinking machine reminds us that computers are already in the imagination in 1907. This story includes elements of the burgeoning, electrically wired overlord, uh, not just a telephone, but just wires and juice and electricity and bzz, bzz, things, right? But, okay, adding machines in this world are everywhere. There's a, something called the difference engine uh, that was uh, from a previous century, actually. And uh, clockwork gears and astrolabs calculate time, space, and velocity crime-solving, medical diagnosis, and empirical scientific methods are seen as reliable as clockwork and might even be resolved with an assemblage of gears such as an astrolab. But the ultimate machine, seeing the brain as a machine, as clockwork gears, right? The human brain and its potential clarity of thinking processes was widely likened to the precision of clockwork and thus emerges Futrell's The Thinking Machine. And that's my opinion. That's my writing. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I hope you guys are uh, comfy and uh, that you're equipped with, uh, equipped with your uh, sweet uh, drink. Yeah. Mm. Because tonight, it's not Holmes on the case. It's the thinking machine, and this man can think. He doesn't even need to be in a place. He can just think it. His mind is so great, right? Really great criminals are never found out for the simple reason. Well, actually, I'd like to do his voice a little bit different. I'm, I'm hoping that I can keep this consistent. Really great criminals are never found out for the simple reason that their greatest crimes, their crimes, are never discovered, remarked Professor Augustus SFX Van Dusen positively. There is genius in the preparation of crime, Mr. Grayson, just as there must be in its detection, unless it is the shallow work of a bungler. In this case, there have been instances where even the police have un have uncovered the truth. But the expert criminal, the man of genius, the professional, I may say, regards as perfect only that crime which does not and cannot be made 
to appear a crime at all. Therefore, one that can never under any circumstances involve him or anyone else. The financier, J. Morgan Grayson, regarded this wizened little man of science, the thinking machine, thoughtfully, through the smoke of his cigar. It, it is a strange psychological fact that the casual criminal glories in his crime beforehand, and from one to ten minutes afterward, the thinking machine continued. For instance, the man who kills for revenge and wants the world to know it is his work. But at the end of ten minutes comes fear, and then paradoxically enough he will seek to hide his crime and protect himself. With fear comes panic. With panic, irresponsibility. And then he makes the mistake, and that hews a pathway which the trained mind can then follow from motive to a prison cell. There are men who are found out, but there are men of genius, Mr. Grayson, professionally engaged in crime. We never hear of them because they are never caught, and we never even suspect them because they make no mistake. Imagine the great brains of history turned to crime. Well, there are today brains as great as any of those of history. There is murder and theft and robbery under our noses that we can never dream of. If I, for instance, should become an active criminal, he paused. Grayson, with a queer expression on his face, puffed steadily at his cigar. I could kill you right now, here in this room. The thinking machine went on calmly. And no one would ever know or suspect. Why? Because I would make no mistake. It was not a boast, as he said. It was merely a statement of fact. Grayson appeared to be a little startled. Where there had been only impatient interest in his manner, there was now fascination. <clears throat> uh, how, how would you kill me, for instance? He inquired curiously. With any one of a dozen poisons, with vir virulent germs, or even with a knife, a revolver, replied the scientist placidly. You see, I know how to use poisons. I know how to inoculate with germs. I know how to pr produce a suicidal appearance perfectly, with neither revolver or knife. And I never make mistakes, Mr. Grayson. In the sciences, we must be exact. Not approximately so, but absolutely so. We must know. It isn't like carpentry. A carpenter may, may make a trivial mistake in a joint, and it will not weaken his house. But if the scientist makes one mistake, the whole structure tumbles down. We must know. Knowledge is progress. We gain knowledge through observation and logic, inevitable logic. And logic tells us that two and two make four, not sometimes, but all the time. Grayson flicked the ashes off his cigar thoughtfully, and little wrinkles peered out his eyes as he stared into the drawn, inscrutable face of the scientist. The enormous straw yellow head was cushioned against the chair, the squinting, watery blue eyes turned upward, and the slender white finger at rest, tip to tip. The financier drew a long breath. I have been informed that you were a remarkable man, he said at last, slowly. I believe it. Quentin Fraser, the banker, who gave me the letter of introduction to you, told me how you once solved a remarkable mystery in which... Yes, yes, interrupted the scientist shortly. The Ralston Bank burglary, I remember... So, so I came to you to enlist your aid in something which is more inexplicable than that. Grayson went on hesitatingly. I, I, I know that no fee I might offer would influence you, yet it is a case which... State it, interrupted the thinking machine again. It, well, it isn't a crime. That is, it, a, a crime that can be reached by law. Grayson hurried on. 
but it, but it has cost me millions, and for one instant the thinking machine lowered his squint eyes to those of the visitor, then raised them again. Millions? he repeated. How many? Eight, six, perhaps ten, was the reply. Briefly, there is a leak in my office. My plans become known to others almost by the time that I have perfected them. My plans are large. I have millions at stake. And the greatest secrecy is absolutely essential. For years I've been able to preserve this secrecy. But half a dozen times in the last eight weeks my plans have become known. And I have been caught. Unless you know the street. Wall Street. You can't imagine what a tremendous disadvantage it is to have someone know your next move to the minutest detail and knowing it defeat, defeat you at every turn. No, I, I don't know of your world of finance, Mr. Grayson, remarked the thinking machine. Give, give me an instance. Well, we'll take this last case, said the, fin fin said the financier earnestly. Briefly, without technicalities, I, I had planned to unload the securities of the PQ and X Railway, protecting myself through brokers and, uh, and force the outstanding stock down to a price where the other brokers acting for me could buy far below the actual value. In this way, I intended to get complete control of the stock. But my plans became known. And when I began to unload, everything was snapped up by the opposition, with the result that instead of gaining control of the road, I lost heavily. The same thing has happened with variations half a, half a dozen times. I presume that is strictly honest, inquired the scientist mildly. Honest? repeated Grayson. Well, certainly. Of course. I shall not pretend to understand all that, said the thinking machine curtly. It doesn't seem to matter anyway. You want to know where the leak... You want to know where the leak is. Is that right? Precisely. Well, who, who's in your confidence? No one except my stenographer. Who is he, please? Uh, uh, she's a woman. Miss Evelyn Winthrop. She's been in my employ for six years in the same capacity. More than five years before this leak appeared, I trust her absolutely. No man knows your business? No, replied the financier grimly. I learned years ago that no one could keep my secrets as well as I do. There are too many temptations. Therefore, I never mentioned my plans to anyone. Never. To anyone. Except your stenographer, corrected the scientist. I, I work for days, weeks, sometimes months, perfecting plans, and it's all in my head, not on paper, not a scratch of it, explained Grayson. When I say that she is in my confidence, I mean that she knows my plans only half an hour or less before the machinery is put into motion. For instance, I planned this uh, PQ&X deal. My brokers didn't know of it. Miss Winthrop never heard of it till twenty minutes before the stock exchange opened for business. Then I dictated to her, as I always do, some short letters of instructions to my agents, and that's all she knew of it. You outlined the plan in those letters? No, they told merely told my brokers what to do. But but a shrewd person, knowing the contents of all those letters, could have learned what you intended to do. Yes, but no one person knew the contents of all the letters. No one broker knew what was in the other letters. <clears throat> Miss Winthrop and I were the only two human beings who knew all that was in them. The thinking machine sat silent for so long that Grayson began to fidget in his chair. Who, who was in the room, besides you and Miss Winthrop, before the letters were sent? He asked at last. No one, responded Grayson, emphatically. For an hour before I dictated those letters, until at least an hour afterward, after my plans had gone to smash, 
and no one entered that room. Only she and I worked there. But when she finished the letters, she went out, insisted the thinking machine. No, declared the financier. She didn't even leave her desk. Or perhaps sent something out, carbon copies of the letters. No, or called a friend up on the telephone, continued the thinking machine quietly. Nor that, retorted Grayson. Or signaled to someone through the window. No, said the financier again. She finished the letters, then remained quiet. Oh, she finished the letters, then remained quietly at her desk reading a book. She hardly moved for two hours. The thinking machine lowered his eyes and glared straight into those of the financier. Someone, someone listened at the window, he went on after a moment. No, it's sixteen stories up, fronting the street, and there's no fire escape. Or the door. If you knew the arrangement of my offices, you would see how utterly impossible that would be, because nothing is impossible, Mr. Grayson, snapped the scientist abruptly. It might be improbable, but not impossible. Don't say that. It annoys me exceedingly. He was silent for a moment. Grayson stared at him blankly. Did either you or she answer a call on the phone? No one called. We called no one. Any apertures, holes, or cracks in your flooring or walls or ceilings? Demanded the scientist. Private detectives whom I employed uh, looked for such an opening, and there was none, replied Grayson. Again, the thinking machine was silent for a long time. Grayson lighted a fresh cigar, set it settled back in his chair patiently. Faint, faint cobwebby lines it began to appear on the dome-like brow of the scientist, and slowly the squint eyes were narrowing. The letters you wrote were intercepted, he suggested at last. No explained Grayson flatly. Those letters were sent direct to the brokers by a dozen different methods. Every one of them had been delivered by five minutes of ten o'clock, different methods, and when the change begins, the stock exchange begins business. The last one left me at ten minutes of ten. Dear me, dear me. The thinking machine rose and paced the length of the room. You don't give me credit for the extraordinary precautions I've taken, particularly in this last PQ and X deal, Grayson continued. I left positively nothing undone to ensure absolute secrecy, and Miss Winthrop, I know, is innocent of any connection with the affair. The private detectives ex suspected her at first, as you do, and she was watched in and out of my office for weeks. When she was not under my eyes, she was under the eyes of men to whom I had promised an extravagant sum of money if they found the leak. And she didn't know it then, and doesn't know it now. I'm heartily ashamed of it all because the investigation proved her absolute loyalty to me. On this last day, she was directly under my eyes for two hours, and she didn't make one movement that I didn't note because the thing meant millions to me. That proved beyond all question that it was no fault of hers. What could I do? The thinking machine didn't say. He paused at a window, and for a minute, and for minute after minute, he stood motionless there, with eyes narrowed to mere slits. I was on the point of discharging Miss Winthrop, the financier went on, but her innocence was so thoroughly proved to me by this last affair that it would have been unjust, and so, suddenly, the scientist turned upon his visitor. Do you talk in your sleep? he demanded. No, was a prompt reply. I had thought of that, too. It's beyond all ordinary things, Professor, yet there is a leak that is costing me millions. 
It comes down to this, Mr. Grayson, the thinking machine informed him crabbedly. If only you and Miss Winthrop knew those plans, and no one else, and they did leak, and were not deduced from other things, then either you or she permitted them to leak, intentionally or unintentionally. That is as pure logic as two and two make four. There is no need to argue it. Well, of course I didn't, said Mr. Grayson. Then Miss Winthrop did. declared the thinking machine finally and positively. Unless we credit the opposition, as you call it, with telepathic gifts hitherto unheard of. By the way, you have referred to the other side only as the opposition. Do the same men, the same clique, appear against you all the time, or is it only one man? It's a clique, explained the financier, with millions of back of it headed by Ralph Matthews, a young man to whom I give credit for being the prime factor against me. His lips were set sternly. Why? demanded the scientist. Because every time he sees me, he grins, was the reply. Grayson seemed suddenly discomfited. The thinking machine went to a desk, addressed an envelope, folded a sheet of paper, placed it inside, and sealed it. At length, he turned back to his visitor. Is Miss Winthrop at your office now? Yes. Let us go there, then. A few minutes later, the eminent financier ushered the eminent scientist into his private office on the street, Wall Street. <clears throat> the only per person there was a young woman, a woman of twenty-six or seven, perhaps turned, and she turned, and she saw Grayson, then resumed reading. The financier motioned to a seat. Instead of sitting, however, the thinking machine went straight to Miss Winthrop and extended a sealed envelope to her. Mr. Ralph Matthews asked me to hand you this, he said. The young woman glanced up into his face frankly, and with, yet with certain timidity took the envelope and turned it curiously in her hand. Mr. Ralph Matthews, she repeated, as if the name was a strange one. I don't think I know him. The thinking machine stood staring at her aggressively as she opened the envelope and drew out the sheet of paper. There was no expression saved surprise, bewilderment rather, to be read on her face. Why, it's a it's a blank sheet, she remarked, puzzled. The scientist suddenly the scientist turned suddenly toward Grayson, who had witnessed the incident with frank astonishment in his eyes. You telephone a moment, please, he requested. Certainly here replied Grayson. This will do, remarked the scientist. He leaned forward over the desk where Miss Winthrop sat, still gazing at him in a sort of bewilderment, picked up the receiver and held it to his ear. A few moments later, he was talking to Hutchinson Hatch, reporter. I merely wanted to ask you to meet me at my apartment in an hour, said the scientist. It is very important. That was all. He hung up the receiver paused for a moment to admire an exquisitely wrought silver box, a vanity box, on Miss Winthrop's desk beside the telephone, then took a seat beside Grayson and began to discourse almost pleasantly upon the prevailing meteorological decision conditions. Grayson merely stared. Miss Winthrop continued her reading. Professor Augustus S.F.X. Van Dusen, distinguished scientist, and Hutchinson Hatch, newspaper reporter, <clears throat> were poking around the, among the chimney pots and other obstructions on the roof of a skyscraper. Far below them, the slumber and shrouded city was spread out like a panorama, streets dotted brilliantly with lights and roofs, hazily visible through mists of night. Above, 
The infinite darkness hung like a veil with star points breaking through here and there. <clears throat> here are the wires, Hatch said, Hatch, Hatch said at last, and he stopped. The thinking machine knelt on the roof beside him, and for several minutes they remained thus, in the darkness, with only the glow of a flashlight to indicate their presence. Finally, the thinking machine rose. That's the wire you want, Mr. Hatch, he said. I'll leave the rest of it to you. Uh, are you sure? asked the reporter. I'm always sure, was the tight, tart response. <clears throat> Hatch opened a small hand satchel and removed several queerly wrought tools. These he spread on the roof beside him. Then, kneeling again, began his work. For half an hour he labored in the gloom, with only the flashlight to aid him, and then he rose. It's all right, he said. The thinking machine examined the work that had been done, grunted his satisfaction, and together they went to the skylight, leaving a thin, insulated wire behind them, stringing along to mark their path. They passed down through the roof and into the darkness of the hall of the upper story. Here, the light was extinguished. From far below came the faint echo of a man's doorsteps as the watchman passed through the silent, deserted building. Be careful, warned the thinking machine. They went along the hall to a room in the rear and still the wire trailed behind. At last the door, at the last door, they stopped. The thinking machine fumbled with some keys, then he opened the way. Here, an electric light was on. The room was bare of furniture, the only sign of recent occupancy, occupancy being a telephone instrument on the wall. Here, the thinking machine stopped and stared at the spool of wire which he had permitted to wind off as he walked, and his thin face expressed doubt. It wouldn't be safe, he said at last, to leave the wire exposed as we have left it. True, this floor is not occupied, but someone might pass this way and disturb it. You take the spool, go back to the roof, winding the wire as you go. Then swing the spool down to me over the side of the building so that I can bring it in through the window. That will be best. I'll catch it here, and thus there will be nothing to indicate any connection. Hatch went out quietly and closed the door. <clears throat> Twice the following day, the thinking machine spoke to the financier over the telephone. Grayson was in his private office. Miss Winthrop Ezzard at her desk when the first call came. Be careful in answering my questions, warned the thinking machine when Grayson answered. Do you know how long Miss Winthrop has owned the little silver box which is now on her desk near the telephone? Grayson glanced round involuntarily to where the woman sat idly turning over the leaves of her book. Yes, he answered. For seven months. I gave it to her last Christmas. Ah, ah exclaimed the scientist. That simplifies matters. Where did you buy it? Grayson mentioned the name of a well-known jeweler. Considerably later in the day, the thinking machine called Grayson to the telephone again. What make of typewriter does she use? Came the querulous voice over the wire. Grayson named it. While Grayson sat with deep, with deeply perplexed lines in his face, the diminutive, the diminutive scientist called upon Hutchinson Hatch in his office. Do you use a typewriter? Demanded the thinking machine. Yes. What kind? Oh, four or five kinds. We have... Half a dozen different makes in his office. They passed along through the city room, at that moment practically deserted until finally the watery blue eyes settled upon a typewriter with the name emblazoned on the front. 
That's it, exclaimed the thinking machine. Write something on it, he directed Hatch. Hatch drew up a chair and rolled off several lines of the immortal practice sentence, beginning, Now is the time for all good men. The thinking machine sat beside him, squinting across the room in deep abstraction and listening intently. His head was turned away from the reporter, but his ear was within a few inches of the machine. For half a minute, he sat there listening, and then shook his head. Strike your vowels, he commanded, first slowly, and then rapidly. <clears throat> again, Hatch obeyed, while the scientist listened, and again he shook his head. Then, in turn, Every make of machine in the office was tested in the same way. At the end, the thinking machine rose and went his way. There was an expression, nearly approaching complete bewilderment, on his face. For hour after hour that night, the thinking machine half lay in a huge chair in his laboratory, with eyes turned uncompromisingly upward in an expression of complete concentration on his face. There was no change in either his either in his position or his gaze as minute as minute succeeded minute. The brow was deep was deeply wrinkled now, and the thin line of the lips was drawn taut. The tiny clock in the reception room struck ten, eleven. Twelve. And finally, one. At just half past one, the thinking machine rose suddenly. Positively, I am getting stupid, he grumbled half aloud. Of course, of course. Why couldn't I have thought of that in the first place? So it came about. But Grayson did not go to his office on the following morning at the usual time. Instead, he called upon, he called again upon the thinking machine an eager, expectant response to a note which had reached him at his home just before he started to his office. Nothing yet, said the thinking machine as the financier entered, but here is something you must do today. At one o'clock, the scientist went on, you must issue orders for a gigantic deal of some sort, and you must issue them as precisely as you have issued them in the past. There must be no variation. Dictate the letters if you've always done to Miss Winthrop, but don't send them. When they come to you, keep them until you see me. You, you mean that the deal must be purely imaginative? inquired the financier. Precisely, was the reply. But make your instructions circumstantial. Give them enough detail to make them absolutely logical and convincing. Grayson asked a dozen questions, answers to which were curtly, curtly denied, and then went to his office. The thinking machine again called Hatch on the telephone. <clears throat> I've got it, he announced briefly. I want the best telegraph operator you know. Bring him along and meet me in the room at the top floor where the telephone is at precisely 15 minutes before 1 o'clock today. Telegraph? Telegraph operator? Hatch repeated. That's what I said. Telegraph operator. Replied the scientist irritably. Goodbye. Hatch smiled whimsically at the other end. As he heard the receiver banged on the hook, smiled because he knew the eccentric ways of the singular man, whose mind so accurately illuminated every problem to which it was directed. Then he went out to the telegraph room and borrowed the principal operator. They were in the little room on the top floor at precisely fifteen minutes of one. The operator glanced about in astonishment. The room was still unfurnished save for the telephone box on the wall. What do I do? He asked the thinking machine. I'll, t I'll tell you when the time comes, responded the scientist, as he glanced at his watch. At three minutes of one o'clock, he handed a sheet of blank paper to the operator and gave him final instructions. There was ludicrous mystification on the operator's face. But he obeyed orders. 
grinning cheerfully at Hatch as he tilted a cigar up to keep the smoke out of his eyes. The thinking machine stood impatiently, looking on, watch in hand. Hatch didn't know what was happening, but he was interested. At last, the operator heard something. His face became suddenly alert. He continued to listen for a moment, and then came a smile of recognition. Less than ten minutes after Miss Winthrop had handed over the typewritten letters of instruction to Grayson for signature, and while he still sat turning them over in his hands, the door opened and the thinking machine entered. He tossed a folded sheet of paper on the desk before Grayson and went straight to Miss Winthrop. So you did know Mr. Ralph Edward, uh, Mr. Ralph Matthews, after all, he inquired. <clears throat> the woman rose from her desk in a flash, and, and a flash of some subtle emotion passed over her face. What do you mean, sir? she demanded. You might as well remove the silver box, the thinking machine went on mercilessly. There is no further need of a connection. Miss Winthrop glanced down at the telephone extension on her desk, and her hand darted toward it. The silver vanity box was directly under the receiver, supporting it. So all that weight was removed from the hook, and the line was open. She snatched the box, and the receiver dropped back on the hook. Thinking, The thinking machine turned to Grayson. It was Miss Winthrop, he said. Miss Winthrop, exclaimed Grayson. I can't believe it. Read the paper I gave you, Mr. Grayson, directed the thinking machine coldly. Perhaps that will enlighten her. The financier opened the sheet, which had remained folded in his hand, and glanced at what was written there. Slowly he read it aloud. Peabody, sell 10,000 shares, L&W at 97. McCracken Co., Sell 10,000 shares, L&W at 97. He went down, he went, he read on down the list, bewildered. Then gradually, as he realized the import of what he read, there came a hardening of the lines about his mouth. I understand, Miss Winthrop, he said at last. This is the substance of the orders I dictated, and in some way you made them known to persons for whom they were not intended. I don't know how you did it, of course, but I understand that you did do it, so... He stepped to the door and opened it with grave courtesy. You may go now. Miss Winthrop made no plea, merely bowed and went out. Grayson stood staring after her for a moment, then turned to the thinking machine and motioned him to a chair. What happened? he asked briskly. Miss Winthrop is a tremendously clever woman, replied the thinking machine. She neglected to tell you, however, that besides being a stenographer and a typist, she's also a telegraph operator. She's so expert in each of her lines that she, that she combined the two. If I may say it that way, in other words, in writing on the typewriter, she was clever enough to be able to give the click of the machine the patterns in the Morse telegraphic code so that Another telegraph operator at the other end of the phone could hear her machine and translate the clicks into words. Grayson sat staring at him incredulously. I still don't understand, he said finally. The thinking machine rose and went to Miss Winthrop's desk. Here's an extension of the telephone, with the receiver on the hook. It happens that the little silver box which you gave Miss Winthrop, is just tall enough to lift this receiver clear of the hook, and the, and the minute the receiver is off the hook, the line's open. When you were at the, your desk and she was here, you couldn't see this telephone. Therefore, it was a simple matter for her to lift the receiver and place a silver box underneath, thus holding the line open permanently. That being true, the sound of the typewriter, the striking of the keys would go over the open wire to whoever was listening at the other end. Then, if the striking of the keys typed out your letters and, by their frequency and pauses, simultaneously tapped out telegraphic code, 
An outside operator could read your letters at the same moment they were being written. That is all. It required extreme concentration on Miss Winthrop's part to type accurately in Morse rhythms. Oh, I see, exclaimed Grayson. When I knew that the leak in your office was not in the usual way, continued the thinking machine, I looked for the unusual. There's nothing very mysterious about it now. It was merely clever. Clever? repeated Grayson, and his jaw snapped. It's more than that. Why, it's criminal. She should be prosecuted. I shouldn't advise that, Mr. Grayson, returned the scientist coldly. If it is honest, merely business, to juggle stocks as you told me you did, this is no more dishonest. And besides, Remember that Miss Winthrop is backed by the people who have made millions out of you. And, well, I wouldn't prosecute. It is a betrayal of trust, certainly, but... He rose, as if that were all, and started toward the door. I would advise you, however, to discharge the person who operates your switchboard. Um, <clears throat> was she in the scheme, too? demanded Grayson. He rushed out of the private office into the main office. At the door, he met a clerk coming in. Where's Miss Mitchell? demanded the financier hotly. I was just coming to tell you that she went out with Miss Winthrop just now without giving any explanation, replied the clerk. Good day, Mr. Grayson, said the thinking machine. The financier nodded his thanks, then stalked back into his room. In the course of time, the thinking machine received a check for $10,000, signed J. Morgan Grayson. He glared at it for a little while, then endorsed it in a crabbed hand. Pay to the trustees' home for the crippled children. And sent Martha, his housekeeper, out to mail it. Well, there you have it. <sighs> It's kind of shorter tonight. Let me see. What do we got? Maybe an hour? Less? 42 minutes? Well, I'm kind of beat anyway. Hope you guys are good. Hope you're doing real well. Happy Saturday night to you. Maybe you're going out. Maybe things are starting. Maybe the world is coming back. Maybe the world is already back. Or maybe, maybe, maybe there's a whole lot more virus to come. In that case, I'll be back. And I'll have more cool stories for you every week. I promise. I don't usually promise. But I'll promise this time. Hope you like my polka dot tie this week. Right on. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Good night.